OK, I think uh, I think we'll make a start. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for for joining us today for for this event on 1971 and um, the uh, uh, escalating crisis in in Northern Ireland uh, of that year. Uh, my name is Peter Gray. I'm the director of the Insti Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University Belfast, and it's my great pleasure to to welcome uh, you all and to thank in particular our our speakers for participating today. Uh, as I'm sure everyone's aware, there's been a lot of commemorative attention. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this year to the uh, centenary of the establishment of the state of Northern Ireland and partition and all the uh, uh, associated events uh, uh, that are involved with that in the decade of centenaries. Much less attention, I think, has been given to the um, events of 50 years ago, and we thought uh, we'd do something to uh, address that by putting on this event today to look at the events of 1971. Uh, in Northern Ireland on their ramifications. Um, this was a year in which, of course, Unionists sought to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Northern Irish state uh, through the Ulster 71 uh, events, but it was a year in which that state uh, um, descended into, uh, into crisis, um, in which the news ag agenda was dominated by um, uh, by violence, uh, by uh, the escalation of, of insurgency, um, by sectarian um, atrocities and of course by the introduction of internment without trial uh, in August uh, of that year uh, and the uh, consequences of that of, the, of that imposition. So we're going to, to discuss um, uh, those events in their, in their historical context today. Um, we've got uh, three panels, each with three speakers. Uh, followed by uh, a plenary uh, by um, Nalo Doherty, uh, which will be this afternoon. Um, uh, I'm going to pass over to the um, chair of our first session in just a minute, but just before I do, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, so this uh, event is being recorded, so if you don't want to appear in the recording, just turn your camera off um, and then you won't appear. Um, uh, if you could turn your microphones off when you join the meeting, that would be great and uh, keep them off just so we don't get any feedback. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of every three speaker session. Uh, and to do that, there should be a little button on your screen with a face and a hand. So if you click on that button and then on the hand icon, that will hand, raise your hand, hand and then on digitally the hand and just indicate that, that you want to ask a, ask a question. Um, we uh, are, we'll have a lot of people on, on the call. We want to get as many people involved as possible. So when you do come to ask questions, please keep your questions short and focused and of course keep them keep them civil. Uh, I know we're dealing with very contentious and very difficult uh, history today, um, but we want this event to be as, uh, uh, as um, collaborative as, as possible. OK, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Melissa Baird. Uh, of Queen's University Belfast, who is going to chair the first session. So, Melissa, over to you. Hi, morning, everyone. So our first panel is entitled The Crisis of 1971, and our first speaker is Tom Hennessy, who is a professor of modern British and Irish history at Canterbury Christchurch University. His many books include The Evolution of the Troubles, 1970 to 1972, published with the Irish Academic Press in 2007, and the Democratic Unionist Party from Protest to Power, co-authored with Jonathan Tong, Marie Braniff, James W. McCauley and Sophie A. Uh, Whitting in 2014. Um, and his paper is entitled Stormont, Westminster and the Politics of 1971. Okay, thank you. Um, well, 1971 was a watershed and storm at Westminster relations. There were two MPs, two Prime Ministers, Northern Irish Prime Ministers in turn without trial which was regarded as the last throw of the dice before direct rule and the issue of whether nationalists could serve in Northern Ireland's government rose um, and became prominent as well. Richard Rose called this last point the key point because in Northern Ireland there had been one party government since 1921 and there was no swing of the pendulum, i.e. in an ethnically divided society, um, nationalists could not attain power. And um, uh, this meant that nowhere else in Western democracies at the time was there any equivalent of uh, the Northern Ireland system where one party stayed in power for so long. 
um, nationalists, of course, wanted mainly wanted a united Ireland, and unionists saw this as <coughs> evidence of um, a desire to overthrow Northern Ireland's constitution and regarded British being British and Protestant as being um, essentially the same thing. In 1971, there was uh, James Chester Clark, Major James Chester Clark, as Prime Minister, and he was the embodiment of big Anglo-Irish, big uh, Anglo-Irish, big unionism, big house unionism, with his English accent educator that um, Eton and uh, a former major in the Irish Guards. There was also a Conservative government that had to be contended with. This was the Conservative and Unionist Party at Westminster. And <clears throat> Unionist MPs at Westminster took the Tory whip. The British ministers who dealt with Northern Ireland were Edward Heath, uh, the first grammar school person, boy to become a uh, leader of the Tory party. Before that, had always been um, essentially uh, privately educated. He had a reputation as a bit of a bully. Alongside him was the Home Secretary, which the Home Office was responsible in theory for Northern Ireland. Uh, that was Reginald Maudling, and Maudling was a uh, former uh, off intelligence officer in the British Army during the Second World War. He was a controversial Chancellor of the Exchequer. And famously, on his first visit to Northern Ireland, said, for God's sake, someone bring me a large Scotch, what's an awful country. He later um, didn't deny this, and uh, that's entered the legend of uh, Northern Irish politics and history. Uh, the Foreign Secretary at the time was Sir Alec Douglas Hume. He was an aristocrat and the embodiment of the old Grouse Moore image that Harold Wilson, leader of the Labour Party, had attacked in the sort of swinging 60s. <clears throat> and he'd been Prime Minister in, from 1963 to 64. Um, he was Scots, and he also famously wrote to um, Harold Wilson, uh, Edward Heath saying that the Irish are not like us, which gives you an, an insight into how he defined his Britishness re relating to Great Britain um, solely. And finally, there was Lord Carrington. Lord Carrington was also an aristocrat, the sixth Lord Carrington. He was Defence Secretary, won the Military Cross in the Second World War, and he was responsible for the British Army in Northern Ireland, which is now on the streets of Northern Ireland. One of the issues facing the British government was the dual authority in security which existed at the time. The MOD, the Ministry of Defence, was responsible and Carrington for the British Army in Northern Ireland. But Stormont existed and Stormont was responsible for the Royal Ulster Constabulary as well. So there's this dual authority. So there was a, an attempt to create some form of dialogue and accommodation there, which was the setting up of a joint security committee. And this um, committee was chaired by the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Chester Clark, who also took on the role of Minister of Home Affairs, the equivalent of Home Secretary in the UK government. It also contained the RUC Chief Constable, who was originally Sir Arthur Young, and then replaced by Sir Graham Shillington. And it also had the General Officer Commanding Northern Ireland in charge of British troops on the ground in Northern Ireland, originally Sir Ian Freeland, and later uh, Sir Harry Tuzo of the Royal Artillery. The UK rep, the UK was represented not only by Tuzo, but by a UK rep, a senior civil servant from the Foreign Office, originally Sir Oliver Wright, a diplomat as well from the civil service, and then later ha Howard Smith. Howard Smith later went on to be C or the Chief of the Secret Service or head of MI6. And there was also a Northern Ireland security advisor providing um, security advice to the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. Now, Carrington and Tuzo had to take account of the Northern Ireland government's views as long as a democratically elected government existed at Stormont. And of course, one of the problems with that is that the, Nor the, the Northern Ireland government was responsible or responsive to its own supporters who elected it. Um, and this was illustrated by the fact that when Lord Carrington visited Northern Ireland, met the Northern Ireland cabinet, he referred to Britain and his the British government as Her Majesty's government and it, having to deal with such issues, whereas he was corrected by the um, Northern Ireland cabinet, who pointed out that they were also Her Majesty's government in Northern Ireland. So as long as this, the Northern Ireland Parliament existed, there was this dual authority, there was this status that existed with the Parliament, 
But as Chichester Clark realised and pointed out to the um, um, uh, British government, the problem was that Northern Irish, the population, i.e. the Protestant population, did not realise or accept that Northern Irish, the Northern Irish Parliament was a subordinate parliament. Westminster was sovereign over all things in Northern Ireland. The Protestant population tended to regard it as a co-equal parliament. Whereas James Callaghan, previously Home Secretary under Labour government, had re referred to the Northern Ireland Parliament as a glorified county council. There was an unwritten rule that Callaghan pointed out between the Labour, Conservative and Liberal parties in, in Westminster. That direct rule had to be avoided at all costs. There was a fear, as Chichester Clark had pointed out to Callaghan when he was Home Secretary, and considered abolishing or suspending the Northern Ireland Parliament, the fear of a Protestant reaction. And so Oliver Rice, as UK rep, had pointed out that the British could not afford to antagonise two communities. And he said, and I quote, we will have to bash a few Catholic heads, on quote. If they had choice came to it, they'd have to rely on, on backing the Northern Ireland government and at the expense of the Catholic community. And Callaghan also pointed out that as long as there was a Northern Ireland government, as he put it, carrying on, it would be very stupid, as he put it, to get to the UK government to get involved because the UK government was involved with its own troops on the ground. He pointed out that we'd all had our fingers burnt before and memories of 1921 were still alive. So the partition settlement was only 50 years old at that point and people remembered the situation back in 1921. There was also, I think it's important to re recall that the Tory government was elected in June 1970 and many people believe that the Tory government had enacted a tougher security policy but the first meeting of the Northern Ireland Committee at Westminster, Gen 47 it was called, decided there'd be no change in policy, that the reform programme would be carried on from the uh, Labour government's policy. And the biggest threat they regarded to uh, public order in Northern Ireland was Protestant marches. And also Edward Heath pointed out to Jack Lynch, the TG Irish Taoiseach, that Northern Ireland government wouldn't be treated as a puppet. They would be calling over ministers to uh, London at uh, a regular interval, such as the Prime Minister to deal with various crises and stuff. But what changed was events on the ground. June 1970 saw the British Army virtually lose control of Belfast and also this followed with the Falls Road curfew. So those are the backgrounds to the situation, but the situation is also impacted by the steady decline in public order and the British Army Court in the middle. Chichester Clark also had his own problems and that problem was the Unionist Party. There was one Unionist Party, which is a broad church um, containing all all different shades of unionist opinion from Protestant unionists, i.e. traditional unionists, um, who believe that there was a Protestant parliament set up for a Protestant people, to so-called liberal unionists who accepted the need to reform. And it's important to realise that there was an overlap. So one could be a Protestant unionist and a reformer as well. And outside the unionist party, there was, of course, uh, Ian Paisley, and he set up the Democratic Unionist Party in 1971. But it's also important to remember he was in a minority. Many found in the Unionist Party his antics extreme, even if they shared his views. So he exercised a sort of moral conscience on many of the hardline elements of the Unionist Party. And he was opposed to the uh, reform package, which he regarded as appeasement, which also many in the Unionist Party were uncomfortable with. And that reform package included police reform, the abolition of the B specials, the replacement by the RUC Reserve and the Ulster Defence Regiment as a uh, part-time uh, regiment of the British Army and the, the on and the disarming of the uh, police force as well. There's also an ombudsman um, brought in to look at complaints about discrimination in central governments, it's Stormont and local government reform. That's where the power lay in the Stormont system. Um, the allocation of resources at a local level and the new electoral boundaries that were going to uh, be brought in by the, um, the former local government, including one man, one vote brought in over under Terence O'Neill, his last act, um, and the setting up of a new housing authority, the uh, Central Housing Authority, Northern Ireland Housing Executive. So that's the basic background.
And in 1971, in February 1971, the background was a new IRA offensive, particularly a provisional IRA offensive, which saw three soldiers killed in February 1971, one RUC Special Branch officer. These were the first British soldiers killed in Ireland since 1922. And in March 1971, three soldiers from the Royal Fusiliers, a Scottish regiment, including two brothers, were executed by the IRA and their bodies found uh, uh, at a roadside uh, lay-by uh, where they'd stopped to relieve themselves after coming home from a party. It could have been worse. Their third brother, who was also stationed in Northern Ireland, at the last minute decided not to go out with, with, the, um, with his brothers, his two brothers and the other soldier. This meant that Chichester Clark was under tremendous political pressure. And Reginald Maudling, when he met Chichester Clark, soon afterwards noticed that Chichester Clark's morale had de had declined considerably and the three soldiers had had massive impact on the Union's community, including a march by 3,000 Protestants in the centre of Belfast who demanded internment without trial, which was on the statute book of the Northern Ireland government and the formation of some form of third force. On the 20th of March, uh, in a meeting with Carrington and Chichester Clark, Chichester Clark just told Carrington, he had no authority anymore and he had no credibility. In a desperate attempt to get some security response, he asked the British government to um, and the army to agree that there would be static uh, bases set up in so-called uh, dangerous areas such as Republican areas and cordons, military cordons be thrown around an area and there'd be the formation of a third force. But the British army under Tuzo was quite clear that the situation, the level of violence did not merit this at all. So Chichester Clark was the first victim, political victim, of the, uh, uh, the increase in violence in early 1971. It's also important to know that no state, at no stage did he ask for internment. He didn't believe that the situation reached the levels that internment was um, necessary. In his place was Brian Faulkner, who was elected as Prime Minister, trouncing Brill Craig in the um, election in the uh, the the poll of uh, unionist MPs. He was seen as a hard man, but he was also seen particularly by members of the Protestant community as not necessarily trusted because of his ambition um, to become prime minister. And but the British government took the view that Faulkner was the last the last unionist leader of any credibility before possibly a Craig or um, Paisley led government in a general election, and that was the last the last option before direct rule would have to be introduced. So on the 22nd of June, Faulkner offered the SDLP places on parliamentary committees, which was seen as a step forward and received a relatively positive view from the SDLP. These committees would have no executive power. But they would have oversight over Northern Ireland departments such as education and agriculture, etc. And this idea originated with uh, during Chichester Clark's premiership as well. July also saw a new IRA offensive, this time in Derry. And this is where two Catholic youths were shot dead in disputed circumstances by the British Army. It was controversial. Again, because Faulkner in May had talked about the, the concept of people who are engaged in violence would be shot on sight on suspicion of having arms. Um, and he was, as Faulkner said, he was doing this to reassure, quote, law abiding citizens, unquote. But the SDLP demanded an inquiry and they ultimately didn't get an inquiry and they boycotted Stormont's as a result. Violence and disorder continued to increase and members of the security forces were, cons were consistently being killed by both sections of the IRA, the official IRA being the other element in this. A seminal event occurred with the bombing of the Daily Mirror offices in Belfast, which took violence to a new level. Um, and Faulkner, for Faulkner, this was clearly uh, this was clearly uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And he, from that point on, was conscious that internment on trial was on the cards. 
He couldn't contain his cabinet much longer in the demands for internment. And it was on the 30th of July, the British government were also conscious that internment would have to be introduced at some point in the near future. This is when Sir John Peck, Her Majesty's representative ambassador in Dublin, met with Jack Lynch, the Taoiseach. And so Jack Lynch could have no doubt that internment was on the cards. Peck asked to see Lynch concerning a, quote, secret, unquote, matter. And he presented an agreed text that he hoped Lynch could sign up to. This would be parallel internment, not simultaneous or concerted action, but it would be uh, parallel internment at some point. It also crucially had in the final paragraph the word hypothetical, indicating that no decision had been, final decision had been taken by the British government. Jack Lynch replied that he could not envisage internment at the present time. He could not support it. No Irish government could survive uh, the introduction of internment. And he urged the British government not to go down that route. He pointed out that if you rounded up 1,000 people, suspected people of um, subversives, and 20 of them who were interned were bad people, as he put it, the other, it would make 980 people bad as a result. Extreme unions, he, was, he claimed, were on the rampage in Northern Ireland, and this would force moderate Catholic opinion towards support for the internees. He preferred direct rule to another Northern Ireland general election and a Paisley-led government. He repeatedly referred to the unwisdom of internment, and he said surely the British had enough soldiers and police officers in Northern Ireland to contain the violence. So there's no doubt that Lynch had an early warning that internment was on the horizon. And, but London was thinking about internment after the Apprentice Boys March occurring in August. And Sir Burke Trend, the Cabinet Secretary, the senior civil servant at, in Whitehall, sought delegated authority from the Cabinet to the minister, such as Heath, who would be skippering his yacht Morning Cloud as a cover story, um, that they would have delegated authority and wouldn't have to refer to the Cabinet again should the situation in Northern Ireland deteriorate. But then on the 4th of August, Brian Faulkner phoned Maudling in London and he said he needed to speak to Heath and Maudling on, quote, a grave security matter, unquote. Immediately, Maudling knew what this meant internment and he sent Faulkner a message stating that internment had to be agreed with the British government before it was introduced although it was legally a matter for the Northern Ireland government. He also pointed out that the general officer commanding Tuzo was not in favour of internment. He also pointed out that the UK government would be guided by security situation, by the security situation and the advice, security advice they received. But all the, all the apprentice boys march later in August and all processions, Protestant processions, would be have to be banned simultaneously. And he also pointed out that, that the GOC position was that all processions, including the Prentice Boys, should not be banned as well. So having been given this, Faulkner agreed and he came over on the 5th of August the next day, where Gen 47, the Northern Ireland Committee, was meeting. And Faulkner met Maudling beforehand and he pointed out that the chief constable of the IOC was now in favour of internment, that the UK rep representing the British government, of course, was now favouring internment because the decline in the political situation meant by inference that Faulkner would probably lose his job as prime minister. And Maudling commented that internment would have to be used in the near future, probably sooner rather than later. Maudling had produced a memo to his cabinet colleagues in a uh, Gen 47 colleagues in which he pointed out the pros and cons of introducing the internment. The pros were it would demonstrate to Faulkner supporters his determination to tackle violence. It would also be based on reliable intelligence, which would prove incorrect as it turned out. It would combat the wall of silence, the impossibility sometimes to get convictions uh, because of the intimidation or the sympathy for the Republican cause. In terms of 
cons. He pointed out that there's no certainty, certainly that all dangerous men, as he put it, would be identified, that those sympathetic to the IRA but passive would be stimulated by internment and would now become active, that it would be politically damaging domestically and internationally, and also that Jack Lynch was not going to introduce um, internment, parallel internment across the border. But he argued there's a fair chance that after initial spurts of violence, the IRA campaign may lose its effectiveness. Although he accepted that there would be a stronger link between the Catholic community and IRA activity and stronger demands for some form of larger share by Catholics in the Northern Ireland government. And also a problem might be that Protestants, the Protestant community may welcome in term, but in the longer term, if it had no major effect on violence, this would dissipate. Heath in the committee pointed out a refusal to accede to Faulkner's demands would seriously damage his political position. And the, U, the British government would bear responsibility for this. They then called in uh, the chief of the, uh, the uh, general staff, the most senior officer in the army, Sir Michael Carver, and Tuzo, who both said that there was no need at this moment for internment. After getting this advice, they asked Fulton to return to the meeting. He formally asked for internment and Heath accepted that there would be internment, provided that the Apprentice Boys March and all processions would be banned. So um, we know really that um, the effects of internment and that there was the ill treatment of certain uh, 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 IRA pr suspected IRA internees, which led to Heath setting up an inquiry under Sir Edmund Compton into this. He denied Compton found there was not torture, but there was quote degrading inhumane inhumane treatment unquote um, inflicted during the interrogations of these twelve men. His reaction was one of fury. Had, he argued that the report had no context of the IRA campaign and he complained that anyone who didn't get three star treatment in as an internee was um, given really a free pass. Uh, it led to him uh, establishing the Parker Committee into investigating whether internment should be continued or the, in, the uh, interrogation practices should continue. So there was something that had to be done. The violence didn't dissipate, it increased. And this led to the summit of three prime ministers, Faulkner, Lynch and Heath. Uh, before this occurred, Sir Bertrand wrote to Heath arguing for a new policy of some sort. He, was argue, he argued that the British government was living from day to day. This kept the melting pot from boiling over. But at some stage, he points out, the elastic must stop. Direct ruling described as the last resort with appalling consequences, but at least the UK would have the opportunity of dealing directly with Dublin. There would be no Northern Ireland Parliament. The other option was, to, as he put it, quote, let Ulster go on the, with regards to the border. But this did not mean uh, banning in Northern Ireland. It did not mean giving Dublin complete control in Northern Ireland by any means. But it did mean having Dublin have some sort of say in the administration in Northern Ireland. And he pointed out this may not be as crazy as it sounds. So ultimately, this is where the British government went with the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. But in 1971, it was too much for anyone to contemplate with seriousness. But the idea was floating around in British government circles as early as 1971. So the summit between Lynch and Heath both agreed that there should be an end to violence, but where they couldn't agree was on the full participation of the minority community in government. Heath agreed with the principle of having the minority the Catholic represented the, the Catholic minority in government, but it was difficult. He pointed out Republicans could not be allowed into the government. By Republicans, he clearly meant the SDLP who wanted a united Ireland. Lynch retorted with offering, what about quadruple ta uh, talks involving Faulkner, the SDLP, Heath, the British government and the Irish government. And 
Heath replied that this was unacceptable at this present time. No, no UK government could recognise the Irish government's right to be involved in the affairs of Northern Ireland, which, of course, was against what Trend had suggested. Uh, Lynch suggests, what about a Council of Ireland being set up? This was originally in the Government of Ireland Act in 1920 and raised a constitutional guarantee that Northern Ireland would not leave the UK and become immersed in the United Ireland without the consent of the Northern Ireland Parliament. And Heath pointed out that this guarantee was there to reassure unionists. When the three premiers had their summit, um, Lynch originally agreed to the, the premiership to, to the summit, although he had doubts about whether uh, the prime minister of what was a local subordinate parliament should be allowed in. But he went along. He agreed for this occasion to uh, drop the demand. He also had to deal with the the, the issue of articles two and three as a problem for his uh, taking this position that northern that the Irish constitution claimed Northern Ireland as part of its territory and state. Uh, Faulkner was reluctant to meet Lynch, but he pointed out that British public opinion wouldn't, with 17 army battalions in Northern Ireland, it would be very difficult not to agree to meet Heath um, and deal with the and deal with the question of violence. So the three premiers met in September 1971. It was a healthy exchange of views. Lynch and Faulkner agreed on violence, but didn't agree on the origins of the violence. And this is where Lynch put it to uh, Faulkner. Could he not accept just one SDLP representative in his cabinet? Faulkner was clear. It was impossible to accept anyone who, over, who, who sought the overthrow, as he put it, the Northern Ireland constitution. And Lynch replied that this, the SDLP would not accept and he pointed out that Jerry Fitt, the leader of the SCLP, expected some, for, some form of agreement that the SCLP would be as of right involved in the government of Northern Ireland. So, in October, Heath, Maudling and Faulkner had a debrief about Northern Ireland and the summit. Heath asked Heath was concerned that, in effect, the UK government was constantly distracted by events in Northern Ireland uh, from conducting and uh, its policies in the UK, in Great Britain in particular. And Maudling asked Faulkner directly, how far was he prepared to go in including Catholics in the government in Northern Ireland? Faulkner replied that constitutional Catholics, yes, but no Republicans, i.e. the SDLP, could be included in the government. And by constitutional Roman Catholics, he meant those Catholics who might be in the trade union movement um, or civil society. And he warned the British government and Maudling and Heath that he and the Northern Ireland government would, quote, act accordingly if they were faced with this proposition. Heath announced told him that he was disappointed. He hoped that Faulkner could include some Republicans for the present emergency, as he put it, who would forswear uh, seeking a united Ireland for now. That was the end of the meeting and Faulkner thought it was a good meeting. However, crucially, for the first time, Heath and Maudling had moved away from the idea of majority rule by one community. Falkland, Faulkner may have been satisfied with the meeting, but he was on notice and on borrowed time. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, just moving straight on to our second speaker then, who is Dr. Gordon Gillespie. Um, he is a writer and an academic um, and a research associate at the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University. He has published widely on the troubles, including Years of Darkness, the Troubles Remembered, published in 2008, and A Short History of the Troubles, which was published in 2009. Can I go on ahead, Gordon? Let's, let's see if I can... Um, I don't know, can you see that? Um, 
It is loading to... for me. Have you got it? No, the PowerPoint? Yes, it's, yes, that's it there. OK, right. Um, so what, what I was uh, talking about today obviously overlaps with uh, what Tom and Aaron will be talking about. In some ways, it's um, it's the, the, the grassroots reaction to the sort of events that, that Tom was talking about. <clears throat> um, so the jingle for the celebration of Northern Ireland's 50th anniversary might have been Ulster 71, come and join in the fun. But 1971 was a year of further political upheaval and violence. In 1970, there were an estimated 25 deaths resulting from the troubles, 213 shootings and 170 bombs planted. In 1971, there were 174 deaths, 1,756 shootings and 1,515 bombs planted. That's based on uh, RUC or PSNI figures, uh, although Lot's Life gives a slightly higher figure of 28 deaths in 70 and 180 in 71. Although all of these figures would be exceeded by the horrific year that would follow from the perspective of 1971, it seemed that things could hardly get worse. The year saw continuing reform. The Local Government Boundaries Act was to create fair boundaries for the proposed 26 new district councils. The Northern Ireland Housing Executive assumed control of the building and allocation of public house authority housing and the new post of Director of Public Prosecutions was created. However, the reforms were taking place at a time when paramilitary violence and particularly IRA violence was increasing dramatically. On the 6th of February, Gunner Robert ha uh, Curtis became the first British soldier killed in active service during the Troubles. On the 9th of February, two telephone engineers and three labourers were killed by an IRA landmine on Brocker Mountain, County Fermanagh. On the 27th of February, two unarmed police officers were shot dead by the IRA in Belfast. And then on the 9th of March, three off-duty so Scottish soldiers were murdered by the IRA. All of this served to harden grassroots unionist demands for tougher security policy. On the 20th of March, James Chichester Clark resigned as Northern Ireland Prime Minister and Ulster Unionist Party leader after failing to get British support for tougher security measures and was succeeded by Brian Faulkner on the 23rd of March. Faulkner attempted to broaden the government's political base and his new cabinet included David Blakely of the Northern Ireland Labour Party as Minister of Community Relations. Robin Bailey from the Liberal wing of the party was brought into the cabinet, while Harry West was brought back to provide reassurance to the right wing. Faulkner also said about trying to increase the input of the Northern Ireland government into security policy, which unionist critics believed was run by the UK government, which failed to take, secure, take a sufficiently robust line. The division within the UUP over security was highlighted at a special meeting of the Ulster Unionist Council that's the governing body of the UUP, uh, which took place on the 29th of March, when a resolution calling on the Northern Ireland government to resign over its failure to maintain law and security was only defeated by 322 votes to 271. While Faulkner wished to move on to issues like finance and UUP party reform, a substantial part of the grassroots remained focused on marches and security issues. In the midst of this, on the 14th of May, the Ulster 71 exhibition planned to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the creation of Croatia. I'm saying Croatia, watching too much football. Creation of Northern Ireland was uh, opened by the Lord Mayor of London. There was, however, an error of whistling past the graveyard in the official programme when it stated Ulster's problems have possibly been over publicised in recent years. But let no one forget the sincere and determined efforts being made to overcome our difficulties and to build a harmonious and prosperous community. Despite fears that it would be abandoned in the face of civil unrest, the exhibition proved successful and attracted uh, an estimated 700,000 uh, visitors before it closed in September. Relations between the Unionist government and the Orange Order were already tense over the parades of issue, uh, issue of parades. Uh, abandoned parades was due to end in January. Uh, and prior to this, in December 1970, Chichester Clark told Orange leaders that he wanted them to reroute parades at flashpoint areas. This didn't go down well with Orange leaders who feared that parades would be blocked or rerouted if there were complaints from nationalists. However, as Patterson and, and uh, Kaufman note, 
the orange elite proved itself incapable of exercising any significant political leverage on the government throughout this period. On the 22nd of June, Faulkner announced a system of committees to oversee government departments, with half of the chairmanships going to members of minority parties. The proposals were initially welcomed by the SDLP, but were overtaken by later events. Following rioting in Derry on the 8th of July, two men were shot dead by the army in disputed Aye. circumstances and died the following day. The SDLP demanded a full inquiry and threatened to withdraw from Stormont if no, one was not forthcoming. Uh, when no inquiry was offered, the SDLP withdrew on the 16th of July. Faulkner had overseen internment during the 1956-62 IRA border campaign, although crucially on that occasion it had also been used in the Republic. However, it was clearly something that he was considering in January 71 when he stated that tougher action was coming against terrorist agitators and that there must be strong, clear government action to root out those troublemakers who were festering society. As unionist discontent grew, in this, grew during the summer of 71, discussions took place between Ian Paisley and Desmond Bowell and other dissidents from the UUP around the formation of a new unionist party. However, when the Democratic Unionist Party was launched on the 30th of October 71, many of them decided to stay with the UUP. Besides opposition from Ian Paisley, Faulkner also faced pressure from the right wing within the UUP. These groups were loosely based around Harry West and the West Ulster Unionist Council and uh, William Craig, who would go on to form the Vanguard movement in 1972. The IRA bombing campaign had been increasing throughout the year. In January, there'd been 16 explosions, but by June, there were approximately 50 and nearly 100 in July. Faulkner believed that this bombing campaign tipped the scales in favour of introducing internment. British political and military sources were much less sanguine about internment, however, uh, as Tom noted before. Uh, British military commanders were not, uh, didn't feel it was necessary from a security point of view, while Prime Minister Edward Heath warned that if internment failed, then the next stop was likely to be direct rule. Uh, 9th of August 71 saw the introduction of internment without trial. 342 Republicans were arrested, but no loyalists. And the Unionist government didn't see loyalist ter uh, terrorism as a direct th threat to the state in the same way uh, as Republican activity did. Unionist critic Andrew Boyd believed that the arrest of Protestant extremists, extremists would have undermined him, i.e. Faulkner, caused chaos in the Unionist party and exposed the whole so-called loyalist cause for the conspiracy it, it really is. Boyd also believed that internment had been introduced by Faulkner as a ploy to keep himself in power. Loyalist trade unionist paramilitary and later assembly member Glenn Barr, however, was strongly opposed to the use of internment, as indeed was Ian Paisley. In a later interview, Barr stated, I often said to our people, be very grateful, what, be very careful what you wish for. And when internment was introduced, it certainly to me was undemocratic and should not have been allowed. Rather than dampen down violence, the introduction of internment had the opposite effect. By the end of the year, there would be 2,592 troubles related injuries, although this figure would nearly double in 1972. Politically, unionism and nationalism were now even further apart, and the SDLP had launched a civil disobedience campaign, which included a rent and rate strike. The UK government, meanwhile, pressured Faulkner to make overtures to nationalists, and though Faulkner was prepared to move some way, he told the British he would not consider a coalition government with the SDLP. The introduction of internment brought a wave of protests from nationalists. On the 16th of August, nearly 8,000 people took part in a one-day strike in Derry to protest against internment. And on the 26th of August, a series of one-day strikes took place uh, in various towns, including Newry, Derry and Straban. In Derry, as a, uh, as a response, Glen Barr called a meeting of workers from the British Oxygen Company, DuPont, and from power stations uh, at the Victoria Hall, uh, the, Un the Orange Hall in the Waterside, to try to keep factories running in the face of nationalist protests. Uh, they also decided to form a local branch of the Loyalist Association of Workers, the organisation which had emerged in Belfast. As some of the individuals, as far as the individuals were involved, 
uh, were concerned, Barr said that while some were militant loyalists, most were members of the Orange Order. Sure. Loyalist workers were also prepared to use protests to make a political point. On the 6th of September, an LAW uh, industrial stoppage and rally was held in protest against the Northern Ireland government's seemingly ineffective security policy. The Guardian reported that more than 23,000 men and women cheered in the brilliant sunshine as speakers, including loyalist leaders such as Mr. Paisley and Mr. Craig, who have rarely see, been seen before on the same platform, joined forces to tell them that the time for speeches is over, the time for action is here. It can hardly have been a coincidence that this protest took place on the same day Heath was to meet Taoiseach Jack Lynch in London, while Faulkner, Faulkner was to join them in further talks later that month. This did not sit well with right-wing unionists who felt that Faulkner would be dictated to in London. On his return, Faulkner faced a grilling from a special meeting of the UUC, but defended the meeting on the basis that Lynch's support was necessary in combating the IRA in the South. The British government agreed to an expansion of the Ulster Defence Regiment, but unionist demands for a third force, something along the lines of the B-Specials, continued and talk of a Protestant backlash began to grow. In the same month, the Ulster Defence Association was formed uh, from a coalition of local Protestant vigilante groups. In the opinion of Jim McCauley, this development can best be seen as a direct response by the Protestant working class to the worsening conflict on the streets. In some areas, the IRA campaign became attacks on Protestants and recruitment to loyalist paramilitary groups increased. In October, the Dundonald UDA uh, asked, the Mountain View, the Blue Bell, the store, four steps in, where will it happen next? If the force of law and order cannot give or afford us immediate protection, we, the Protestant people of Dundonald area, will defend to our utmost our Protestant heritage and we will never surrender to the murdering scum, the rebels. Inevitably, it was only a matter of time before the organisation began uh, acquiring and using weapons. The UDA had initially began as small groups of local vigilantes at interface areas, protecting local streets from, with checkpoints. In August 71, however, in response to the increase in violence, which followed the introduction of internment, these vigilante groups began to coalesce along military lines. Where the London Dairy Organisation was concerned, Glenn Barr recalled that the local LEW was formed first and then a defence association, which subsequently linked up with the UDA in Belfast. He recalled, I was developing the workers' organisation, the LAW, throughout the whole county, as far away as County Tyrone and into County Antrim. And where I was setting up the workers, the local UDA commander was setting up a military formation with them as well. So all the way from Killen outside Castle Derg, along the border, all the way down through County Tyrone, Straban, and through Ardagarvan, Donamana, and all the way. Gordon, you're on mute. When did you miss much? Uh, not much, but no. um, did you get the Glen Bar quote? I I don't think so. Uh, I'll just go. I'll I'll go back to that again, just briefly. Um, in response to the uh, the growth in IRA. Um, growth in, in, in IRA uh, activity. Um, um, uh, Bar began setting up uh, UDA organisations um, uh, throughout uh, London Derry. And um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Barr said, I was developing the workers' organisation, the LAW, throughout the whole county, as far as uh, County Tyrone and into County Antrim. And where I was setting up the workers, the local UDA commander was setting up a military formation with them as well. So all the way through Killen, through outside Castle Derg, along the border, all the way 
down through County Tyrone, and Straban, in through Ardagavan, Donamana, and all the wee hamlets, we set up a workers' organisation and a paramilitary organisation. A low unionist and loyalist relations with the Conservative government in London were strained. Relations with the Labour opposition were even worse. On the 11th of November, LAW held a protest against the visit of Shadow Home Secretary James Callaghan and Labour Chairman Tony Benn uh, to Northern Ireland, and an estimated 20,000 people stopped work and marched to the Cenotaph at Belfast City Hall. Other protests took place in East Belfast and in Lurgan, where 4,000 protesters brought the town to a standstill. In the House of Commons, on the 25th of November, opposition leader Harold Wilson announced a 15-point plan, which he claimed was a solution to the Irish problem. Wilson suggested uh, Irish unification would take place over a period of approximately 15 years. Move towards a united Ireland would have to be based on Protestant consent, but Wilson made no attempt to explain how or why this consent would be forthcoming. Wilson's proposals did, however, serve the increased unionist sense of isolation even further. Faulkner, like his immediate predecessors, had to try to maintain a balance between reform and maintaining unionist grassroots support. On the 1st of November, 71, Faulkner told the Ard Glass branch of the East Down Unionist Association his own constituency. While it's to be hoped that in the future, when the present wave of terrorism has been put down, political progress will help ensure that terrorism does not again take root in our community. In the short term, no political initiative will mollify the gunman in the slightest degree. There is only one way to deal with the IRA at present, and that is to defeat them militarily by inflicting such losses upon them that they will uh, come to the conclusion that they are not going to shake the will of this community or to overthrow the government. Nationalists may have wanted a full raft of reforms introduced immediately, but this would have uh, been a difficult demand for Faulkner to meet under any circumstances and in the face of an ongoing IRA campaign, a near impossibility. By the end of the year, unionist tempers were near boiling point. On the 8th of December, the Grand Orange Lodge issued a statement saying there could be no discussion on political solutions while the constitutional future of Northern Ireland was in jeopardy. As they said, the tampering with the institutions of democracy is an attempt to pl placate undemocratic rioters and anarchists is not to be tolerated. Then on the 4th of December, a 50 pound UVF bomb exploded in McGurk's bar in Belfast, killing 15 Catholic civilians, including the wife and 14 year old daughter of the bar owner. The Loyalist paramilitary campaign had now reached a new level. By the end of 1971, Lost Lives estimates that Loyalists were responsible for 22 of 180 deaths that year, compared to 107 killed by Republicans. In 1972, Loyalists would kill 121 people, compared to 279 by Republicans. For unionism, 1971 was a year in which tensions within the Ulster Unionist Party and between the UUP and other strands of unionism and loyalism continued to grow in the face of paramilitary violence and continuing demands, although mostly from outside unionism, for further reform to be undertaken quickly. These divisions would increase further in 1972 with the suspension of the Northern Ireland Parliament and the worst year of violence, leading to further political division and a growth of loyalist paramilitary groups and loyalist paramilitary violence. OK, thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, and then we're just going to go straight into our third and final speaker for this panel, um, and that is Dr. Aaron Edwards, who is a senior lecturer in Defence and International Affairs at the Royal Military Academy in Sadhurst and an honorary fellow of the University of Leicester. His books include UVF Behind the Mask, um, which was published with Marion Press in 2017, and most recently, Agents of Influence, British. Uh, Britain's Secret Intelligence War Against the IRA, um, published this year. So if you want to go on ahead, Aaron. Thank you very much, Melissa. Just wait on my PowerPoint presentation loading up. A great deal of myth has grown up around the British Army's operations in the early 1970s. Uh, the May 2021 issue of Van Poblacht the official media outlet of the Provisional Republican Movement sees it as a time when, quote, British soldiers swooped into nationalist districts across the six counties. 
in covering the recent inquest into the killings of 10 people in West Belfast in 1971, AP said that the, quote, uh, the backdrop of the Ballymurphy massacre was in general the reaction of the Orange State and its military wing made up of the RUC, the British Army and Loyalist death squads to an assertive nationalist community that stood up and fought back after the pogroms of 1969. In the aftermath of the verdict, uh, General Lord Dannett, a veteran of the Army's operations, offered his condolences to the families of those who died in August 1971. He said these 10 deaths should not have happened and it was poor decision making by a number of soldiers, probably poor leadership at the junior level, operating at a time of great violence amidst the poor strategic policy that led to this. It is shameful. Mike Jackson, another former head of the, the army who had served uh, during the early years of uh, Operation Banner, the code name for the army's operations at the time, um, told the Ballymurphy inquest a few years ago that there was no specific training apart from the yellow card and that it was mayhem. And that's how he characterized those days, um, specifically in 1971. Uh, Lord Dannett has been quite vocal, uh, particularly Lord Dannett, in uh, uh, writing uh, and speaking about what he calls politically motivated witch hunts against former soldiers. He's written in a number of newspapers, particularly uh, a few uh, two years ago, that it is a tenet of basic training and a fact rammed home in all operational pre-deployment preparation he wrote in one article, the British soldiers know that they must always act within the law of armed conflict, the terms of the Geneva Convention and our national law. Where a soldier acts outside the law, he must ex expect investigation, the line of possible charges to be tested in a court and if convicted to receive punishment. There are no exceptions. These perspectives uh, go some way to shaping and influencing the public's understanding of army operations in 1971. However, they are limited for they exclude context which is crucial to a more comprehensive picture of why uh, building up a more comprehensive picture of why lethal force was used in the way it was, particularly in the early years of the Troubles. One historian of the British Army's long running deployment in Northern Ireland, Ed Burke, has recently written of the quote, increasingly polarized and politicized narratives around Operation Banner, which he uh, believes are deeply frustrating, in part due to the quote, present uh, high profile and acrimonious public debate over whether to prosecute a small number of former soldiers, which means that, in his view, perceptions of the British Army's role in Northern Ireland risk being defined by the Army's worst incidents in a very long war, despite evidence to support moments of professional restraint. Andrew Sanders has recently written about the toxifying uh, 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 nature of um, the uh, these investigations. So. Um, I think it's it's only fair really to examine them in the context of the time, specifically in 1971. So the army was a, a key a key actor in the conflict between 1969 and 2007. The understanding of the history of army operations is of course deeply contested and the army's deployment was marked by three phases, what might loosely be termed peacekeeping, counterinsurgency and internal security. So what I want to look at specifically is that um, initial um, changeover from peacekeeping to counterinsurgency, at least as far as the army is concerned. Army operations in 1971 were principally coordinated by the MOD in London um, through the GOC, as Tom has already um, outlined, um, but through a, quite a torturous um, chain of command. Uh, and the reason for that, Tom has already discussed. Uh, there was friction between London and Belfast, due to the devolved responsibilities of the Northern Ireland government for security matters at that time um, and um, where they had been taken away from them, where there was pressure um, really for Faulkner to act. So we, we we know that there has been significant change since the late 1960s into 1971. David Charters reminds us that the process cannot be explained and understood solely as a result of a wiring diagram. Personalities mattered uh, and some were more influential than others. In this period of 1971, the army are firmly in the lead in terms of the, the implementation of security policy, or at least um, the storm government's looking to them to um, run with uh, whatever has been agreed with London. Now, the uh, dominant personalities include uh, the former uh, 
senior officer in charge of operations in Belfast, Frank Kitson. In an address to the US Army War College uh, after relinquishing command in 1972 of 39 Infantry Brigade that had responsibility for operations in Belfast, he said that unfortunately no such coordination existed between the security forces as a whole and the civil authorities, either at city level or below. At the Northern Ireland level, there was a joint security committee in which the Prime Minister sat with the General and the Chief Constable. Um, but even th when operations were coordinated with political and economic measures at this level, there was no such coordination further down. One plan which was formulated in conjunction with the police was based on the legal situation which precluded uh, us arresting anyone who could not be put into court under the normal laws. Kitchen, Kitson's views on counterinsurgency are well known and indeed he had published a book on the topic um, in 1970. Um, and uh, he was quite influential at the time in terms of framing British counterinsurgency doctrine. In the official pamphlet issued in 1971, I can just move the slides on slightly. In the official counterinsurgency pamphlet issued uh, in 1970 to troops, uh, they were reminded that insurgency was a form of revolutionary war based on a groundswell of discontent. And you can see here from the quote, the level of revolutionary warfare is discontent. And whilst the military, purely military operations required to kill or capture the insurgents may well succeed, it is not until the sources of this discontent are removed or rectified that a revolutionary war can be brought to a successful conclusion. The major task is a re-establishment of a cohesive system of local government rather than the defeat of an enemy. So British coin uh, or counterinsurgency doctrine argued that all countermeasures are certain to fail unless there exists a working harmony between the government, indigenous security forces and any friendly forces that come from outside the assist. It was largely based on Britain's experience in uh, its um, by then ailing empire uh, and um, most of those who uh, were in charge of implementing those sorts of principles on the ground, didn't really take into consideration the changing context in which they were operating. Ha having said that, Kitson uh, always made clear in several, he had written um, at least two books by then, uh, in his own writings on counterinsurgency, that the local special branch was key to providing intelligence. However, in Northern Ireland, Kitson observed that um, intelligence was actually not that sophisticated and uh, the special branch were, in his view, they were small, they were tiny and they were um, they were centralised. And so they're not at, at some point in 1971, it's unclear when uh, special branch were then um, permitted uh, by the chief constable to speak to um, more senior and middle ranking army officers. But at that time, according to Kitson, who was in charge of all operations, there wasn't enough intelligence getting down to the soldiers on the ground. Desmond Hamill, writing about that period, said that the intelligence scene was gloomy. The lessons learned in Kenya, Aden, Malaysia, and even in the campaign in Ireland between 1919 and 22 had been forgotten or ignored. There was no coordination between the various services, such as MI5, MI6, the RUC, the Army, and other smaller units, which had been set up. And indeed, in work by David Charters uh, entitled Have a Go, it seems to have been uh, left to uh, the tactical level, those soldiers on the ground, police officers, to try uh, and work up some sort of um, responses to the, the mounting violence. I'll come back to the point on internment uh, towards the end because I want to give, uh, obviously, others the opportunity to discuss that in detail. So according to Kitson, then the army's working on vague uh, information, which resulted in our undertaking offensive operations on something of a hit or miss basis. Much of Kitson's analysis concerned uh, the difficulties facing military commanders as they sought to undertake operations against the IRA, which by early 1971 was emerging as a determined opponent. In fact, as I'll go on to argue, both the tactics practiced by the army and the IRA's own split uh, and the competition between the officials and provisionals would have significant bearing on how operations developed throughout the remainder of the year. 
So some of the British troops who deployed on the streets of Belfast and Derry and other places in 1971 had some operational experience in British colonies like Malaya, Malaya Kenya, Cyprus and Aden or South Arabia, but others did not. Senior ranks like sergeants and commissioned officers above the rank of captain were often the longest serving members of a regiment. Uh, and it is important to acknowledge this at the outset because it gives us some indication of the sort of changing demographics, if you like, behind the uniforms, manning barricades on the streets. The key point here is not all of them would have had operational experience. Some might have uh, fired their rifles in battle. Uh, instead, others would have been heavily dependent on training. Now, it's difficult um, to say anything general about this because some units already had had operational experience in Northern Ireland prior to 1971, others did not. Teaching soldiers to think about, uh, to think before they open fire, uh, ultimately came down to good training and discipline. One officer, a Royal Marine from 4-2 Commando, uh, Captain Rod Bosworth, recalled returning from Malaysia uh, and spending much of the summer in 1970, of 1971 in Plymouth and Dartmoor, training for an imminent four month tour of Northern Ireland. As Boswell recalls, we had to actually conjure up all our own training off our own back, utilising other Royal Marines who had Northern Ireland experience, because almost without exception, there wasn't a man who had served in Northern Ireland because we were all jungle commandos. So he talks about having some lectures on the context, um, but then, uh, and, and uh, at least soldiers had a broad understanding of what was going on in Northern Ireland, um, but that uh, it was very difficult when they deployed because um, obviously, in his words, it was difficult to be non-violent when violence is being perpetrated against you. But of course, that is exactly what we had to be. Incidentally, I mentioned uh, the yellow card at the outset. And as you can see from uh, this slide, this is an example of the, the yellow card. It's actually an original from 1972. The yellow card had gone through a number of iterations, but was actually officially issued in 1972. So that's a year before um, uh, General Jackson indicates that, um, you know, that uh, the yellow card was in use. At that time, uh, there were senior officers and middle ranking officers involved in trying to draft rules of engagement for the troops. Um, but these were patchy. And as I've said, they depended on uh, the level of training given to units uh, by their officers. Some of these units had come in from overseas, some had come from Germany, some were training in the UK, some were training in Germany and other places to try and recreate uh, what they would face in Northern Ireland. Um, the other, the major actor in all of this, of course, is the IRA, which uh, in 1971 had, at least the provisionals, had built up an alternative leadership and command structure to the officials. The Belfast Brigade consisted of three battalions, uh, in Belfast and Billy McKee was the overall commander of the new group, a strict disciplinarian. Uh, he did not try to formulate a long-term strategy to conduct a new campaign uh, according to Bishop and Malley. Instead, uh, he and uh, the provisionals returned to a traditional Republican practice uh, from earlier generations of engaging in ambushing, uh, assassinating and planting mines. According to Bishop of Mali, the provisionals were encouraged by Sean McStephen, who had spent years assessing the success of guerrilla groups in Cyprus and Kenya and ending British rule, and this initially coloured their political thinking. And I would go further and say that because I've just completed some work on this, which is published in the journal Small Wars and Insurgencies, that Sean McStephen's experience in prison uh, in the 19, later 1950s with former IOCA um, members who um, had been imprisoned along with him and some IRA people in uh, English prisons. Actually, he was learning uh, tactics and an operational sort of craft, if you like, back then. And by the 19, by the early 1970s, he was ready to go in terms of having been schooled in this. And so it was just a matter of sending out um, some of their um, volunteers onto the ground. The first soldier to be killed, of course, was Gunnar Curtis, uh, and uh, both Gordon and uh, and Tom have talked about the the, um, the violence and the deaths. So I won't go into that in any great detail. However, uh, what I would say is that the provisionals are obviously building up a momentum here, uh, and um, that goes some way to explain the intensity of conditions facing soldiers. The Green Howards, one regiment that deployed uh, to Ardoyne uh, towards the end of July 1970 one on a four month tour, um, came under uh, quite a lot of what they would call effective enemy fire. And uh, they had no 
uh, training other than the experiences of previous uh, pre previous deployments. Uh, the Northern Ireland Training and Assistance Team, which would have gone through judgmental training, for example, and rules of engagement uh, and so on, and how to deal with that, um, didn't come into um, play until 1972. So it was left the individual units um, to um, to uh, you know work up training packages. Uh, one uh, quote by a former uh, soldier, uh, I think, gives an indication of the kind of mayhem depicted by uh, Mike Jackson. Uh, in one interview, he said, I found myself on Butler Street with my back against the house wall with bricks and bottles raining down. The glasses in the door, sorry, the glass in the door to my right exploded and the window to my left also exploded. And then I saw what appeared to be a SIG. Uh, flicked through the air. I soon found out that it wasn't when it exploded. It was my first introduction to a nail bomb. A shout of mount up back in the pig came. We closed the back doors and set off around the corner. Bang, bang, bang. My introduction to a Thompson submachine gun. IRA operations grew more sophisticated throughout 1971 with new devices discovered by army bomb disposal officers at the Europa Hotel in October 1971. And uh, the, the historical evidence there, the, the archival evidence gives you uh, some indication of how sophisticated they had become. In fact, they had to deploy their senior ammunition technical officer to deal with that because it was uh, a, a device of a new kind. So the IRA is also um, improving on its deadly ingenuity. Um, I won't go into any of the details that Gordon's already given us in terms of bomb explosions, um, but certainly things were beginning um, to, uh, tensions were beginning to heat up and uh, the violence was escalating. So in conclusion, just to bring us to a, a, a bit of a conclusion on this, I haven't time really to go into any other um, examples, unfortunately, but uh, because I think it's important to have some questions. The command and control of security forces operations was confusing even to army commanders. Uh, soldiers' understanding of the historical, political and cultural context in which they were deploying was poor. Even those soldiers who had deployed uh, on a second occasion in 1971, uh, there were, uh, there, they may have had a poor grasp of the fundamental principles of counterinsurgency, but troops were hamstrung by the lack of reform in local government. Uh, and of course, that's key. Um, to uh, bringing about a successful counterinsurgency operation. If you can't, uh, if you can't secure that, then um, it doesn't really matter what military effect you're trying to have. Uh, it will always be feeding on um, the, the negative um, activity uh, and uh, subterranean uh, structural issues that are um, obviously beginning to bite by them. Intelligence was rudimentary and patchy. Those to improve after internment. I'm sure we'll hear more about that after the next session. And taking together these limitations would have serious consequences when lethal force was employed. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of the context, at least at the operational and the tactical level, in terms of um, the British military response uh, in Northern Ireland in 1971. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Aaron. And thank you to all three of our speakers. So we are really tied on time for questions, but if you want to put your hands up, um, and as Peter just said at the beginning, if you can keep it as short and as civil as possible so we can get through any. Okay, we have one from Nathan Watson. Uh, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Um, I was wondering, um, they mentioned the uh, Northern Ireland Labour Party, and uh, I was wondering what role uh, the, because um, out of all political forces in Northern Ireland, this seemed to be the only one that could probably have crossed the sectarian divide, because the unionists obviously weren't going to attract uh, nationalists, and the nationalists were very unlikely to attract unionists. So. Uh, what role did Northern Ireland Labour play in 1971 and why did it fail to be able to bridge this gap? You guys one for you, Aaron, isn't it? 
the NALP. Yep. I'm happy to have a go at, at answering the questions. Obviously not uh, what one immediately directed at me, given my presentation today. Uh, I suppose the, the best guide to what's happening at this time is, uh, you know, Paddy Devlin had had left uh, the Northern Ireland Labour Party. Um, we have, you know, the formation of the SDLP. The, um trying to think what else would have been happening, but certainly the tearing apart of community relations uh, at that time, um, meaning that the NILP was limping on with only part of its membership intact. So I think as a party, uh, you know, the, the, the game was certainly almost up. And uh, although, it, you know, there were influential individuals like David Blakely who were still trying to represent the best of community relations, they couldn't do that when um, most of their membership had started to go off in different directions. So you have some going into the DUP, some going into the UVF, some going into the you know Alliance and all of these other parties that are beginning to emerge. So I think that it's a time of decision for people who are who were previously committed to the NILP prior to the troubles. So certainly as violence is heating up and they're beginning to see what's happening unfold on the streets in working class areas, I think that it's you know that that's that's a probably a decisive year um certainly for the siphoning off and the breaking away and the fragmentation of those members in um you know ca catholic working class areas thank you Aaron. Um, and then we also have a question from rini elliott Yes, hello. Uh, I wanted to ask Erin a question. Sorry, Erin, it's you again. <laughs> um, I'm researching British Army observation posts in um, in Belfast, Shanko Falls area in 1972. And it's very hard to find any, I'm, I'm studying them from point of view of architectural history, and I found it very difficult to actually find any drawings or, you know, site location maps or maps of any sort of them. And I've been having to try and you know, work it out myself. But I was just wondering if you'd come across anything like that in any of the files you've been looking at. Wow, that's a very interesting question. Thanks for that. Um, no, I was just reading yesterday about the how the IRA were attacking these observation posts. Uh, and uh, one one incident I didn't uh, go into, it was the, um, so the, the soldier shooting of Henry Thornton. But the day before that, the IRA had carried out a uh, very elaborate attack because they couldn't uh, they couldn't uh, get to these these posts because some of them were elevated. Um, they 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 simply hijacked a double decker bus and had some couple of gunmen on top who were then shooting at these posts that were largely made out of I think um, you know they were prefabricated. They were made out of wood actually some of them. So I think because they were temporary. Um, but then when we look at incidents like um, the New Lodge killings. Then you see that they're sandbagged um, a little bit more permanent uh, observation posts. As to where you would find information, I guess it would be probably Royal Engineers um, records. Uh, I know that there's certainly mapping and there's work being done on the Belfast segment that comes in uh, and uh, in the 1970s, but I haven't really seen much on, on the observations. I think the best place to look for those would be in regimental archives. And uh, Royal, Royal Engineers, if it was more elaborate than simply something that the soldiers had, had worked up themselves, then they may have plans and architectural drawings. Uh, that would be my only thoughts on, on that. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you, Aaron. We have three other questions, and I'm afraid they're just going to be the only time we have four. So the next one is from Nat, or Neil O'Dockerty. Hi. Thanks to all of the speakers. That was really interesting. A question for Tom. Uh, Faulkner's resistance to any SDLP involvement in government in, in early 1971 seems seems extraordinary from the perspective of even a year later. Um, <clears throat> how do you explain that? I mean, beyond saying, well, he felt he couldn't sell it to his base. Why did he not feel it was important enough to to try? I think it was impossible in the context of the time. Northern Ireland had existed as a one party state since 1921. It was only a major trauma such as direct rule that forced um, 
uh, unionists to address uh, the idea of community government. And it was pretty clear that he regarded the SDLP as Republicans in a broad sense, that he couldn't entertain the idea that anyone who wants committed to overturning the um, uh, Northern Ireland Constitution, even longer term, could be accepted into into uh, the government in Northern Ireland. And you can see this with Sunningdale, you can see this, sorry, with power sharing and so on, and the resistance in 74, that the argument put forward by many unionists resisting that was that these are people from inside the Northern Ireland government who are going to destroy Northern Ireland. So I just think he couldn't accept that. And that it took something like direct rule for him to realise that um, he wasn't in control of events. He became from a prime minister just to an ordinary uh, leader of a party. And he was treated as such by the British government. His status was in decline. And from that, you what do you do? If you think the British might be pulling out or there might be public opinion in Britain shifting towards that, you have to come up with something. And that is when it becomes... Um, uh, uh, the idea of community government becomes amenable to him. Thank you, Tom. Um, the next, the penultimate question is from Craig Tony or Tony Craig. I don't know what way that goes. Yeah, it's Tony. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, thank, thank, thanks for the the papers, Gordon and Aaron and and, and Tom. The I think it's more for for Tom and Aaron. It'll probably be explored in the next in the next panel, kind of more. But do, you know, what explains the behaviour of Bally Murphy uh, in in August seventy one? You know, it's the the when when violence goes far far beyond this insistence on uh, of the yellow card uh, on kind of purely defensive violence and kind of moves into more Frank Kitson's published material goes way beyond the doctrine of uh, uh, of uh, of part three of land operations. Um, and I, obviously, this is now reflected in public record in the in the Bally Mur Murphy inquest verdict as well. Do you want to go, Aaron, first? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So um, I I think a lot more research is going to have to be done on this. And mm. unfortunately, from you know a historian's point of view, we we know that there are challenges in terms of assembling the evidence. Uh, you know to say something definitive about it or to make inferences that are that that are um, more exact than what we're seeing. I think that the inquest revealed that the records are patchy, that the participation of people who participate, who were who were involved in events like that, again, is patchy. Um, and so I don't, I, you know, in terms of determining the factors that led to this is going to be very difficult. But I think that one of them that I'm seeing um, in in the what I'm looking at now in the accounts from the Imperial War Museum sound archive and so on is that there, there's an awful lot of um, pressure on soldiers, uh, but uh, some of them are actually coming back in to the same places where they may have been injured before. And so I read a Belfast Telegraph article where a, a journalist a few years ago had tracked down one of the soldiers who had fired a fatal shot um, against uh, one one of the dead and. He, he said that he was he had revenge in his heart. So again, you've got like some some factors like that. I think psychological, emotional that are playing into it that perhaps have to be looked at as well as the circumstantial and the and the and some of the things that I talked about today. Um, I don't think that it's really uh, very revealing to say it was just mayhem, you know, and that it was a breakdown in discipline. I think that there there is much more than that, you know at stake, I think, in terms of explaining this properly. And, you know, we ought to people who were badly affected by that or indeed who lost their lives. It's a very emotive, um, you know, episode uh, in our history. So I, I would say there are limitations in, in terms of saying anything uh, definitive about it. Uh, perhaps Tom has other other views. Yeah, I think it's it's the parachute regiment. The parachute regiment is a particularly aggressive uh, regiment in the British Army and um, they're the shock troops when there are riots the paratroopers are sent in and riots usually end fairly quickly in Belfast there are a number of incidents involved in the parachute regiment um, including um, a woman blinded by a rubber bullet fired at point-blank range when she's playing records uh, rebel records in a home 
And I think it's ultimately, this is what we see in Bloody Sunday, it's it's ultimately uh, a regiment that is uh, the essential shock troops of the British Army. And other regiments, other battalions have commented that they didn't want the powers deployed because community relations had improved when they'd been deployed, uh, when the uh, regiment, uh, that a particular regiment had been deployed and that had been ruined by the deployment of the uh, parachute regiment at a particular time. So I think it's I think it's down to the aggressive nature of those troops. Can I also add actually that um, the parachute regiment are certainly present, but there are also other regiments that are there's uh, there's a well known photograph of uh, a, a second lieutenant from the parachute regiment deployed alongside um, soldiers from the Queen's regiment. Uh, you know, trying to really untangle whether there was regimental competition there in, in terms of aggressiveness is an interesting dimension. Also, I think that um, there is a changeover in in the Queen's regiment that's caught up in the Ballymurphy massacre as well, and. Uh, so this commanding officer and the adjutant, the two people in charge of you know setting the tone for the regiment, change literally before the soldiers deploy, uh, and in that summer. So you know there's all sorts of organisational dynamics that are going on. I think that feed into it as well as obviously what what Tom has already has already said is is, is an established you know um, point of view and, and fact on this. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Tom. Again, I think that's something we'll cover in the next panel um, as well. So the final question is from Barry Hasley. Cheers. Um, first of all, just want to say uh, thanks very much for um, a great set of papers. Um, my question's really for uh, Dr. Hennessy, um, but others can chip in too. Um, and it's about um, uh, the public reception of the evolving conflict uh, in Britain. So it's about domestic public opinion, effectively. Uh, and really what I wanted to know was, um, uh, from, from your reading of the archival documents, um, what was the government, uh, and in particular the cabinet's uh, reading or assessment of the impact of these events on domestic opinion in England? Mm -hmm. uh, and did that assessment in turn feed back into the shaping of policy uh, and responses? So, so that's part of it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to know was, um, was there a consensus view um, on on the on the domestic impact um, or were there competing views within the cabinet on it? Uh, and this refers, of course, um, to internment, but also to the British Army uh, and potentially also the beginnings of um, the IRA's um, campaign on, in, in mainland Britain as well. Um, how did they interpret public reactions? Um, I think uh, people are unsure what public reactions will be but crucially Reginald Morsling um, at towards the end of 1971 talked about a level of violence that is acceptable and that is um, the acceptable level of violence is entered the, the um, pantheon of uh, quotes from Northern Ireland and it was a it was a so it, at one level they felt they were stuck with it they felt that um, it was contained in Northern Ireland and um, there was no long term solution, but they could contain it never reached a level where it could overspill into into the politics of Britain. There was always public opinion would be asked, what about do, do you favour withdrawal in various polls? And uh, it would be yes, there would be they favour withdrawal. But at the same time, when they asked the same similar questions about what's the solution to it and so on, there'd be more complex responses. So what he did in particular and Maudling and Carrington in conversations with uh, particularly Faulkner was use that as leverage um, to get a particular um, outcome that they wanted. So it's the fear that British public opinion will move against uh, staying in Northern Ireland that is used against sort of Faulkner to get him to agree to certain things such as the meeting with Jack Lynch and so on but that's a constant fear that is always debated in the Northern Ireland cabinet or it's not always debated but it's, it crops up now and again among senior unions politicians. I don't think that people in Britain even with the IRA bombing campaign thereafter in Britain were it wasn't sufficient enough to move public opinion to demand a British withdrawal. 
it was relatively I remember I remember um, in the deal bombing and I was because I was interested in Northern Ireland in I think in 1989 or 88 I was um, shocked by the, um, the the carnage and the event and people in Britain people people I was working with at the time they just noticed it and it was moved on to something else there's never enough it was never going to be Britain's Vietnam as Edward Kennedy put it Thank you for that question, Byron. Thank you, Tom. So we are running about 10 minutes behind. So if we want to take a 10 minute break and then come back for the second panel at 22. And that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> 